Hello, everyone. Welcome to Inside the Americas. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Cuba gets set to have its first president in decades not named Castro. Lawmakers this week naming the country's new leader. Lula mania in Brazil as fans of the former president continue to back their idol's presidential campaign, despite the fact that he's still in jail. And the fallout from the arrest of two black men in a Starbucks continues. The coffee giant saying it will close 8,000 of its U.S. shops for one afternoon next month to give its staff bias training. I'm Jeannie Godula. First up, our number of the week, 59. 59 is the number of years someone with the last name of Castro ruled Cuba. But all that changed this week as President Raul Castro stepped down decades after the 1959 revolution that brought his brother Fidel to power. And while the man set to replace him is the current vice president, many young people in Cuba are both worried and hopeful about what the future may bring. As Cuba enters its post-Castro future, a new generation of politicians is preparing for the challenges ahead. Young people in Cuba have long complained of limited employment opportunities on the island state. Many hope the country's new leader will be prepared to shake off the vestiges of communist economic policy in the name of growth. So many generations have been and gone since the revolution was successful. Those people are of a different time. It's a different historical context. Society is demanding change. Tourism has been the main driver of economic growth in Cuba in recent years. The sector employs thousands of young people. Among them, Valentino. The 26-year-old is working hard to transform this house into tourist accommodation. I see more of a future for me here than in Europe, since I don't have the qualifications to become a professional. Here, everything is about to happen. But in France, in Europe, everything has already been done. Here, you have to get used to living with problems. In the end, the problems will just become a part of you. You get used to it, and everything turns out all right. Not everyone's so optimistic. Young Cubans are increasingly emigrating in search of jobs. For those who stay, stable incomes are hard to come by. I have two jobs, because one isn't enough. I'm young, I want to buy things for myself, for my mom, for my brothers. The only job I have is not enough for me. I have to have another job at night. Young people make up one quarter of Cuba's population. Their hopes for the future depend on what comes next. Next now to Brazil, where fans of former president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva are determined he should run again next fall, despite the fact that he's still in jail. This week, Lula's left-wing backers occupied the beachfront triplex apartment at the center of a corruption case against the former president, who has been jailed. The former president's appealing that conviction, as Charles Pellegrin reports. In the streets of Sao Paulo, in Parliament, or when facing the courts, Lula's supporters won't back down. They chant their love for him and their anger at a sentence they consider to be a political plot. Most of all, they're calling for his liberation. Lula is a political prisoner. And we, the working people, the good people, have an obligation to fight for his freedom so that he can keep fighting for the country. Lula has been sentenced to 12 years in prison for graft. During his presidency, he allegedly received a beachside apartment in exchange for political favors, something he denies, as well as the supporters who occupied his quarters, a protest that not everyone in the neighborhood is on board with. They're only here to say once more that Lula truly does have a connection with this apartment. Pro-Lula voices are also occupying parliament. 60 Labour MPs have added his name next to theirs as a protest against his incarceration. We will never give up. We want Lula to be free because Lula is a political prisoner, a political prisoner in a regime that claims to be democratic. In a hugely anticipated hearing, the Supreme Court will be considering an appeal made by Lula's lawyers. A favorable decision would mean temporary release from prison. 
Lula would then potentially be able to run for president once again. Although this constitutional scholar doesn't think he has a case. Former President Lula is out of the electoral process, not because of the arrest per se, but because he was convicted in a second instance, and we have another law called the Clean Record Law that prohibits people from being candidates if they've been judged for crimes. In spite of his indictment, Lula is leading in the polls. 31% of voters are planning on casting their ballot for the former president, while 15% say they'll vote for his closest rival in the October election. One person was killed on a southwest flight to Philadelphia this week after a window was blown out due to an engine failure. People on board scrambled to try to save the woman from getting sucked out of the window that had been smashed by debris. The plane was able to land, but the woman died later from her injuries. Seven others were hurt. It was the first accidental death on a U.S. passenger airline in nine years. Our picture of the week now is this one. It shows one of two black Americans being arrested in a Starbucks in Philadelphia. They were reportedly waiting for a friend at the time of the arrest. The protests and calls for boycotts that followed, though, prompted the Starbucks CEO to apologize. The coffee giant has also announced 8,000 of its stores will be closing next May 29th for one afternoon to give its staff bias training. Here's more. A public relations battle, the world's largest coffee company is determined to win. Starbucks has announced it plans to close some 8,000 of its U.S. outlets for an afternoon at the end of May, so that nearly 17,000 employees can be trained in how to prevent racial discrimination. The move follows global outcry at the arrest of two black men as they waited for a friend at a Starbucks in Philadelphia. Footage shows onlookers saying the men aren't doing anything wrong before they're handcuffed and led away for trespassing. Starbucks CEO was quick to accept personal responsibility for the incident. What happened in the way that incident escalated and the outcome was nothing but reprehensible. And I'm sorry. One global trends analyst is impressed by Starbucks' damage limitation strategy. You need to figure out how to stop it immediately, whether it's racism, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, discrimination against women, whether in, in pay or whatever. Um, and I think the way you do that is by education, right? And you need to educate your employees. What do we want? Justice! What do we want? Now! Amongst customers, however, it may be some time before Starbucks wins back its reputation. We have been arrested, accosted, Killed in the streets for driving while black and brown. The same has happened for walking. The same is now happening for sitting down in an institution that claims to be community oriented. The hashtag boycott Starbucks has been shared tens of thousands of times on Twitter. The funeral service for former First Lady Barbara Bush has been set for this Saturday. A public viewing will be held at her local church in Houston the day before. Barbara Bush died this week, aged 92, one of only two women to have been both the wife and the mother of U.S. presidents. She made a name for herself, though, promoting literacy and reading to millions of Americans. Ellen Gainsford takes a look back at her life. Nicknamed the Silver Fox by her family, to the American public, she was a grandmotherly figure liked by many for her plain-spoken manner and lack of pretense. Barbara Bush was the second woman in U.S. history to be both a wife and mother of a U.S. president. I had trouble when I was married to the president. And now to see that same fellow that I used to drive around in Little League carpools and I used to yell at to please pick up his room, to see him as president, it's truly amazing. As First Lady, Bush was an advocate for literacy and started the Barbara Bush Foundation to promote this goal, raising over $40 million for literacy programs across America. At a time when AIDS was widely misunderstood, Bush was photographed holding an infant with the virus, spreading awareness that transmission couldn't occur through hugs or handshakes. The public response to AIDS ended up emerging 
as an issue with which she became very closely associated. Um, she showed uh, an unusually compassionate side, certainly for uh, somebody from the political realm at that time. Sharp tongued in private, whilst her husband was in office, she kept her opinions on public policy to herself. But after his mandate was over, Bush revealed she disagreed with him on two issues, her support for legal abortion and opposition to the sale of assault weapons. The prestigious Pulitzer Prizes were announced this week in the U.S., and it was a historic day for hip-hop. California rapper Kendrick Lamar became the first ever rapper to win the Pulitzer for music. Now, he is the first music winner in the 100-year history of the Pulitzers to come from outside the worlds of classical or jazz. It's the latest modernizing move from the Pulitzer Committee after honoring Bob Dylan's lyrics with the Literature Prize in the past or giving Lin-Manuel Miranda's hip-hop-inspired score for Hamilton the Pulitzer for drama. We'll leave you with these pictures. Thanks so much for watching Inside the Americas. We'll see you again next week for all the news from north to south. If I quit your I still Mercedes If I quit this